Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 136, I chat with Laura Kramer of Smith Research about the Smith Realizer, a surround simulator for headphones. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded November 12th, 2012. Episode 136. It's all in your head. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hi there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek. This week's guest geek is Laura Kramer, the vice president of Smith Research, which has developed an incredible surround simulator for conventional headphones, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Hey, Laura, welcome to the show. Hi, Scott. Nice to be here. Thank you. So nice of you to be here. Uh, Those of you who are watching live at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Laura, and I'll pass along as many as I can as we go along. So, Lore, the Smith Realizer, and it's S-M-Y-T-H, correct? Correct. And the Realizer is is this product, this audio processor. Uh, why don't you tell us what, what's the basic idea behind it? Okay, sure. It's a way of recreating very precisely in headphones the sound of any real speakers in any real room. It's, uh, it's a small little box. There it is. People are and, watching uh, can see that it's a small <laughs> box. Yes, it's smaller than, it's about half rack width. And um, mm-hmm. it's both a measurement device and a playback device. So if you identify a speaker system you really like in a room where it sounds really good, you can go there and measure that sound and then come back home and run your signal through the box into headphones and you will recreate very precisely the experience of being in that room with those speakers. And the reason it works as well as it does is that the measurements are made with tiny microphones that go in the listener's ears. So it's a very specific, sorry. I say, I think we have a photo of those tiny little microphones that uh, we can show here for those of you who are watching the video to show that in fact they are, you know, the size of a pencil tip. Right. They go in your ears just like little tiny earphones, but they're microphones. And so the measurement that they make when they're in your ears uh, encompasses not only the response of the speakers and the amplifiers and all the room acoustics, but also your specific body, your upper torso, your head shape, and most importantly, your outer ears. The word for that is pinna, as probably many of you know. And so we're gathering impulse responses. We get an impulse response that incorporates all of that. It's a specific measurement of those speakers in that room as heard by you only. Mm -hmm. And as a result of making it a personal measurement, the result is extremely accurate, not only in terms of tonality and, you know, whatever the decay characteristics of the room are and so on, but also localization. So, It's an eight-channel device, so you can use it for stereo if you were measuring two speakers. You could use it for 5.1, 7.1. It actually doesn't know or care where the speakers are because that's part of the measurement. So you could have overhead speakers, whatever. And that's all the localization, the angle of the speakers, the elevation. And most surprisingly to many listeners, the distance, the perceived distance to the speakers is, is also captured. So if you're measuring a small room, In the headphones, you will hear as though there were speakers in front of you or behind you at a certain distance. Or you could measure a dubbing stage or a movie theater where the speakers may be 50 feet away, and they will localize 50 feet away in your headphones. So Now, uh, part part of the mathematics involved in this, which is 
quite sophisticated, uh, is something called the Head Related Transfer Function, or HRTF, right? Yes, that just refers to the way uh, the sound is modified when it strikes your body and your ears. Uh, because the way, perhaps I should say this, because there may be some people who don't know it, probably many of you do. Of course, it's uh, intuitive that we can hear left and right because we have a left ear and a right ear and you can compare delays and levels and figure out whether something's to your left or to your right. But we can equally easily tell if something is in front of us or behind us or above us or below us. So we have all three dimensions and yet we only have these left and right ears. How is that possible? Well, uh, it's possible because the outer ear and your head shape in general modifies the sound as it strikes your outer ear and then goes on into your ear canal. And so there's complex filters that arise from this. And But the brain doesn't hear that sound as a shaped EQ. It hears it as um, direction. So what we're doing by measuring uh, with the mics in your ears is we're capturing those pinna filters, if you will. The, we're, we're capturing exactly the way your head and your ears shape the sound and giving you that transfer function back. And that transfer function is, Scott, as you said, the head-related transfer function. So we measure that and give it, give it to you back in headphones. And, of course, when your brain hears a sound that your ear has modified in that particular way, then your brain says, oh, that speaker is uh, at uh, 110 degrees behind me. Same, right. way you lo same way you know that in the real world, you hear it in the headphones because we're giving you that same transfer function back. Now, we got a couple of graphics I wanted to show people who are watching the video. Uh, one is, uh, I believe it's called HRTF, and it, it's a picture of a speaker and a dummy head. There it is. And it shows you how the sound waves reach your two ears differently from a speaker at a given location. That's right, and uh, that's a pretty simplistic picture, but obviously the, the ear that's farther away is going to hear some... Uh, some delay and uh, level difference versus the other one. This, this, this probably is more relevant to the uh, delay and, and level differences between the two ears. But you, you can hardly see the outer ear in this picture, but that will modify the sound in, in a complex way. If you look at uh, different angles of sound that go through your outer ear, you'll see all sorts of choppy responses. In fact, you'd look at that and say, well, that, that must sound pretty bad. But again, the brain knows what those filter shapes are. It knows that they're directions. So, um, in, in fact, we have a, a, a picture of that as well called HRTF graph, I think, uh, which shows us a three-dimensional plot. There it is of, of what the actual head-related transfer function looks like, uh, which, as you say, uh, can you describe a little bit about what, what, you're, what we're seeing here? Well, actually, I've never seen these <laughs> before. Oh! <laughs> uh, but, uh, Sorry to spring that on you then. <laughs> oh, no, it's okay. Um, but, yeah, you can see it's a complex filter, uh, complex filter shape. Yeah. And uh, this will be different for every angle and every person. So everyone's ears are different, as we well know, looking at people's ears. They're shaped quite differently. They're kind of of a family, so uh, they more or less do the same thing, but the details are different. And so that's why if you have some sort of a system, as many people have, some sort of a surround in headphone system, which is gives you some sense of something being behind you or in front of you, uh, that's based on some kind of generalized head, maybe a dummy head or a generalized HRTF, whereas ours are based on your particular ears filters, which um, when you hear your own ears, it's, it's very, very realistic. So uh, when somebody buys one of these, what do they do? Do they actually have to come to your facility and, and get measured uh, it, with certain types of test signals? How does that work? Well, the box that I held up a minute ago comes with the measuring microphone. So once you buy it, you're equipped to make your own measurements, and the, the manual is very detailed on how to do that. It's a step-by-step -step process. Mm -hmm. uh, you do indeed need to go to the place that you want to measure. Now, some people want to measure their own home system uh, in order to, for example, take their home theater to bed and hear it in headphones uh, without disturbing the wife. Mm -hmm. um, 
Or you may have a friend who has a really great setup. You'd like to capture that, so you'd have to go over to his house to do that. In our in Los Angeles, uh, where we're located, um, we have made arrangements with a couple of studios and a movie theater, and we will take people to those places and uh, get you measured in really good uh, monitoring environments or, again, in a movie theater, if you want that, that kind of sound. Or you can make your own arrangements. You can go rent studio time or visit a dealer who has a nice showroom and see if he'll let you make a measurement there. But but yes, the, the concept is you need to go wherever it is that you want to measure because it has to be your ears that, that do the measurement. Mm. And, uh, and In you the environment that you want to recreate. Yes, because you're capturing not just the speaker response, but the room acoustics as heard right, by you. Exactly. Yeah. Now, this sounds like it, it requires a pretty hefty... Uh, processor with with some serious power. What can can you quantify what that might be in terms of of uh, floating operations per second, flops, or uh, any any other sort of megahertz or gigahertz or anything like that? No, actually, I can't answer that because I'm not an engineer. And I didn't design the box, so <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that. But it is a it's a DSP. There's one DSP chip in there that's that's able to do it. It's a convolution process. So uh, we're taking the impulse responses that we gather and convolving that with the incoming signal. Uh, I should add there's another thing the, the box does, which is that it does head tracking. So normally, of course, if you're sitting in a room listening to speakers, if you turn your head, the sound doesn't move. But if you're wearing headphones, every time you turn your head, the sound moves with your head, which is quite unnatural but we're used to it with headphones oh that's true you know i i it as you move your head around the speakers are going to go with you basically and and it's going to maintain the same orientation with respect to your head at, at any angle right but what which you're is saying not, not which not is natural. not the way the, not the way the real world or the world of speakers works and if you're right. watching uh, if you're if you're working with sound with picture like if you're watching a movie or working on a movie uh, you certainly want the dialogue to stay on the screen and the surround stuff to be behind you and so on. So when you turn your head with our system, uh, the system knows which way your head is pointing so we can compensate or counter-rotate the image so that it appears to your brain to stand still. So Wow, and, and we have pictures of that as well. I want to show the, uh, first of all, the head, uh, it's the um, head mount thing. It's It's a thing that you mount on your headphones Right. Uh, I forgot. I've forgotten the name of the of the. There we go. There's a there's a picture of a lovely Asian woman wearing a pair of headphones, uh, with this head tracker device sitting on the top of it. Yes. Now those are Stax uh, 202 headphones, and they have a very high headband there. I want to want to uh, make clear that the head tracker is the little rectangular thing on the top there. It's the the rest of that is actually part of the headphones, and you you can clip that little rectangular thing to any headphone headband we have a way of getting it on onto any headphone and uh that's what tells the system which way your head is pointing it's it's wireless so there's no right and, and there's a there's a there's a set top there's a little thing that sits on the top of the tv as well that uh transmits or, or receives i should say the information from this device there it is that's right that that thing uh is actually pretty small it's uh maybe uh an inch high the the upper part of it and uh that is placed somewhere in front of you it can be the distance is irrelevant it can be if you're at a workstation it can be sitting on the top of your screen if you're in a home theater it can be back where the screen is there mm -hmm. and uh it uh it's the thing as you say it communicates with the thing on your head to complete the head tracking system uh now how does it how do they communicate is it ir or rf yes IR. it's ir Yes. So if you turn completely around, it, it would lose it would lose sync. It would lose contact, right? So you that's, can't that, like. That's right. the uh, The head tracking system is intended to work uh, over a range of sixty degrees. That is thirty degrees to either side. It'll actually work a little bit further than that, but um, mm. that range uh, it's extremely accurate. And uh, the thought is, if you turn farther than that, nothing horrible happens. The image just starts drift as it always does with headphones and then you come back into range and it locks back in place so if you need to mm -hmm. turn to the side to make some kind of adjustment or something uh but the, the logic is that if you're actually working on a project or if you're listening for pleasure or whatever you're probably going to be pretty well within that 60 degree 
range, and and so we're able to deliver very accurate uh, tracking within that range. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, um, connections. Let's talk talk a bit about the connections on this box. Uh, I believe they're all analog, aren't they? No, we have analog and HDMI. Ah, good. So, uh, there's eight. As I said earlier, it's an eight-channel box, um, so you can connect up to eight analog channels or HDMI. And then there's also eight output analog channels, which are used for the test signals that run to the speakers. And those don't even need to be connected once the measurement is made. There you go. So you got your eight. This actually is an old photo because the original uh, realizer didn't have HDMI. So uh, if you were, well, actually that's a newer one, but I think it's it's cut off a little bit there at the top. Above, where it, above each group of eight uh, jacks, eight analog, those are all analog jacks. And then above each group of eight is now is an HDMI jack. Ah, so, so there's an HDMI in and an HDMI out? HDMI through. Is an in and through. Through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. you can uh, go on from there to uh, to a display, for example. If your right. uh, player didn't have two outputs, you can send it to the realizer and then relay it from the realizer on out to a screen. And then how do the headphones connect to the realizer? Well, you have three choices. There's a front panel quarter-inch jack, so you can plug your headphones right into that. If you want to use an external headphone amp, there's a, a pair of RCA jacks on the back that you can connect to your, your own headphone amp. Or if you want to use an external DAC, there is an SPDIF output on the back, which you can run into an external DAC and then into an external. Uh, the, you'd have to go to further to the right on that drawing if you want. On, there you go. There's the phone's digital out. That's SPDIF. So you can run that to a... Uh, an external DAC, and then to an external headphone amp. So it's totally up to you how far external you want to go with it. The The DAC inside is a, a very good Burr Brown, and the headphone amp is very good too. So if you just plug right into the realizer, you'll get quite a good result. But, you know, a lot of people have their own favorite amps and DACs and so on. So this, this allows you to use any of that. Right. I saw a couple of connectors there labeled tactile. What's that? Well, you know, one problem with headphones is that you don't get body conducted bass. Uh, even if the headphones deliver bass, as some headphones are able to do, it still doesn't feel like listening to subwoofers or listening to the real world. So the tactile outputs are allow you to use shakers or tactile transducers that you would put uh, under your chair. Like D-Box uh, or Butt Kicker, that kind of thing. That sort of thing, yeah. Um, now, I, some of you may have had demos of these shakers, and, and typically the uh, demos are set pretty high, uh, <laughs> understand, understandably, because it's kind of fun yeah. and it's, well, it's an effect. For but, most people, it's fun. It makes me sick, so. <laughs> well, what, what you want to do and, and what we would recommend with the realizer is you you really don't, in this application, you don't really want to be aware of the shakers. It's not it's not to shake you for fun. It's to substitute for a subwoofer. So what you want to do is turn it down to where you can't feel it at all and then turn it up just a little bit so that you're, you get the body conducted sense of, of bass without uh, localizing to a shaker. So if you set it just right, you can, uh, you can, it'll never be quite the same as a subwoofer, but it's, it becomes a pretty good substitute. Uh, quack in the, the chat. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, Quack in the chat room is asking, would HDMI video have a lag to the audio at the monitor end due to uh, processing? Uh, uh, would, would there, is there a delay, an appreciable delay introduced through the box based upon all of this audio processing that's going on? Uh, there is a little bit of latency, but uh, not very much. I actually forget the numbers in our spec sheet. It's, it's uh, I would say it's negligible. But um, you could certainly compensate that small amount if you needed to. The video that's coming through is unaffected. Right, right. So how did this whole device and system come to be? Who, who was the inventor? What was his inspiration? Well, the inventor is uh, primarily Stephen Smith, um, who was also the person who developed the DTS algorithms, both for movie theaters and for the home. In ah. fact, every, uh, and his brother, Mike Smith, also did some of the design work. 
And uh, I'm also ex-DTS, so that's how I know Stephen and Mike. And uh, there's no connection with DTS. We're, we're ex-DTS folks. Um, and uh, so he's a, a very, uh, you know, very clever and skilled designer of things audio. And he had been, as he tells it, working on uh, distance learning and hoping to be able to link groups of people uh, remotely in a way that they could more easily tell who they're talking to if it's a group of people. And if, if that group of people could be localized, um, then it might be easier to tell who you're talking to on the other end. And uh, that apparently was what he had been thinking about when he realized that, in fact, he had a much more general purpose technology that could be used uh, in the way that this is being used. Hmm. Uh, Beatmaster in the chat room is is asking which Burr Brown DAC. <laughs> the show is called Home Theater Geeks, after all. <laughs> I don't remember the model number, but if uh, is is my uh, email going to be shown? Um, anybody anybody who would like to email me is welcome to. You see at the screen there the the website address, and my email is simply lore l o r r at smith-research.com. If you'll drop me an email, I'll tell you the model number. I don't don't remember it. Okay, cool. And any not other questions? Secret, not a secret. Yeah, not a secret. Happy yeah, to tell you. Yeah, understood. <clears throat> so, um, so, yeah, I remember hearing a number of, of um, surround simulators. Dolby has one and Dolby Headphone, which was originally from an Australian company called Lake, as I recall. That's right. And... Um, and there have been others. Odyssey might have one. I don't remember now. I guess the primary distinguishing feature here between the Realizer and the other ones uh, is the customization, personalization, if you will, of the yes. head-related transfer function and the head tracker that lets you move your head around uh, w w while keeping the apparent, the virtual speakers s steady in place. Yes, I would say the personalization is the major distinguishing feature. Mm -hmm. And I would say those other systems are really different animals. It's it's not that we're saying ours is good and theirs is bad. It's really a different thing. Theirs does what it can with um, a generalized set of HRTFs. And uh, again, those might be based on dummy <coughs> heads or averages of human heads. There's, there's databases out there of, of HRTFs that you can purchase from universities and so on. So there's ways to get your hands on the data. But unless it's your personal uh, HRTF, the realism of the result is going to be quite seriously compromised, both in terms of the tonality of the sound, because it turns out if you listen through someone else's ears, which you actually can do with the realizer, you can listen to someone else's measurement, you'll find that the sound is a little brighter or a little duller. It's unpredictable. It just depends on how your ear shapes compare. And then in particular, the localization is not as precise. And the most difficult thing to do by far is getting the sound out of your head in front. Because if you've heard some of these uh, generalized systems, you do get some sense that there is some sound behind you. It may not be very uh, precisely localized, but it's, it's apparently behind. But it's very, very difficult to get the sound, especially the center channel sound, out of your head in front. But if you use your own personal measurements, it goes right out to where the measured speaker was. So again, if you measure yourself in a movie theater, that center channel is going to be 50 feet in front of you, or depending on what, what row you sit in, you know. But sure. uh, to get that uh, extreme or that real, an externalization, uh, it, it isn't anymore a question of, you know, whose algorithm is better. It's just a matter of are you doing personal or, or not? And you really mm -hmm. have to use personalized HRTFs to get that effect. And that's the thing that most people are the most surprised about when they hear the realizer because y you might – imagine, okay, they can capture the tonality and they can capture the uh, reverberation decay of the room and so on. That kind of makes sense. And I guess it makes sense they can kind of get the angles like it's, it's 30 degrees for that speaker and 110 for that one. But what they're not prepared for, what no one seems to be prepared for until they hear it, is the externalization. That is the sense that the sound source is way outside your head. And... Um, uh, that's just something you have to hear to uh, appreciate. Yeah, SoCal Ray Jr. in the chat room is saying uh, that he got a chance 
some three months ago to try the system at a friend's home theater and says, amazingly real sound, sounded like my buddy's triad speaker system exactly. Well, indeed, one of the things you do right after you make a measurement is you, we, we have it set to where when you take the headphones off, the real speakers that you just measured come on. And then when you put the headphones back on, the speakers go off and the headphones come on so that you can directly make an immediate a B comparison between the measured speakers and the recreated speakers. And that's the toughest possible test. That's, that's an instantaneous comparison and you're going to find any differences right there. And, uh, often people say they don't hear any difference. Uh, sometimes they'll say they hear a slight difference. Uh, but we're looking for, we would never claim a hundred point zero percent with any process, I don't think, but we certainly strive for 99.9. And, and again, the thing that surprises people the most is that the sound is apparently coming from those speakers out in front of you or behind you. They're not, 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 not coming from the headphones. And of course the head tracking adds to that illusion because you're, even if you're not moving your head very much, just very small head movements and the sound doesn't move then your brain's telling you you're not listening to headphones. Right, right. Well, I've got another couple of questions in the chat room, which I'll get to in a minute. But before I do, I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, which is Netflix. Of course, most of you already know about Netflix and how it streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to your home on just about any consumer electronics device you might have. TVs, Blu-ray players, gaming consoles, dedicated streamer boxes iPhones, Android phones, tablets. Like I said, just about everything has a Netflix app on it now that lets you stream all of that content uh, to any display device you might have, including the tablet and the iPhone or the TV that uh, is in your main room or your secondary room, wherever it is. You can even start watching on one device and finish on another. So if you're getting a little sleepy and you might say, you know what, I think I'm going to finish this in bed and... Uh, even if you drop off, you can finish it up later uh, after <laughs> you wake up again. Whatever you want to do, it's the ultimate inconvenience. Now, for listeners of this show and of Twit, um, <clears throat> there is a free 30-day trial offer for those few of you who might not have tried it already. All you have to do is go to netflix.com slash twit. And be sure to use that URL, netflix.com slash twit, for your free 30-day trial. And we thank Netflix very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks and the entire Twit Network. So, um, F Loop in the chat room is asking, what is what are Smith's recommendations regarding headphones for use with the Realizer? This was a question I was going to get to. F Loop made it to me, uh, made it before I did. Uh, some headphones change response with small positioning changes, and distortion performance varies widely. He says. What do you, what do you how do you respond to that? Right. Uh, well, there's in addition to measuring the room, the realizer also measures the headphones that you're using. So, with the microphones in your ears, you put the headphones on over the microphones, and uh, the realizer measures the way the headphone, the particular headphone ear cup, interacts with your particular outer ear, and it also linearizes the headphone to an extent that you can control. So, in that sense. Uh, the Realizer is designed to work with any headphones. Now, needless to say, we're, if you're trying to precisely recreate the speaker sound and the room sound as we are trying to do, uh, you can't use poor headphones and expect a good result. The Realizer will do its best to compensate, but you need to start with something good. Um, but you are free to use any one of a number of very good headphones. We... I we tend to use Stax headphones ourselves, and we, if you order the product from us, you, we can, at your option, bundle some Stax headphones with it. It's not required. But uh, they're a very good combination of uh, very good sound and very good comfort, which is important because if you're using the real life, chances are you're going to have the headphones on for long periods of time, and comfort is very important. So they're electrostatic headphones, and they have a bunch of models from uh, entry level is H50 and it goes on up to 4000 or something like that. But there's other great headphones out there, you know, the planar magnetics like uh, Odyssey and uh, Hi-Fi Man and uh, Sennheiser 800s. And uh, there's just so many uh, good ones, and a lot of people are using in-ear monitors as well. 
Some people really like can, IEMs, and you can do that. Can you do that? I mean, these microphones are in your ear. How can the uh, in-ear monitors also be in your, your ear? Well, you're right. You can't measure. You, you can't do the headphone measurement step. But remember, the main reason for that step is the interaction of the ear cup with the pinna, the outer ear. And, <laughs> and with and an in-ear monitor, there is no such interaction. There's no pinna, there's no head cup. So the only thing you're missing in that case is the linearization. And if you have IEMs that, that, are, that you think are good, you enjoy, and are per fairly linear, then it won't be any worse with the realizer. So um, uh, again, there's people who love those and think that's the best thing you could possibly listen to, and you can use those with the realizer, and other people wouldn't like them at all. But it's an option for you. I just had a thought. If you have the in-ear monitors, where are you going to put the, the head-mounted gizmo right you need to go to the drugstore and buy a headband <laughs> and uh try to find one in a uh, dignified black right and uh, then you can just clip the head tracker to that okay all right good uh web 7332 is asking is the realizer for one user only or can multiple hrtfs be stored well, those are two separate questions in a way. Yes, the realizer will support two simultaneous listeners with their own personalized measurements and simultaneous independent head tracking. So you can have two people oh. sharing. Now, the only limitation there is the realizer has only one headphone amp in it. So at least one of those users has to use an external amp. But uh, the sound is there if you want to grab it. Now, Aside from that, the realizer will store 64 room measurements and 64 headphone model measurements. But even that is not a limit because there's memory cards. So there's, there's effectively no limit to the number of uh, systems you can collect and, and call up at any time. So if you oh, so had, it's, got a, it's got like a memory, like an SD card slot or something like that? Exactly right. It's an SD card slot in front. Yep. So you can store... A, a, HRTFs for as many people as you want, and any two of them can play simultaneously. Correct. Wow. That's actually pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> so here's the big question. How much? The realizer itself is $2,910. And again, that includes the measuring microphones and the head tracking system. Yeah, with, uh, the, with the entry level stacks, it's thirty seven sixty. But the the realizer okay. itself is twenty nine ten. So twenty nine ten, close to three thousand dollars, which is an awful lot of money. But uh, you know, you, you really are doing something pretty spectacular. Uh, well, there. uh, there's there's ways to think about that. We we sell actually a majority of our uh, a majority of our sales goes to the professional market, and for them, it's a big money saver. If you think about it, it could be true for home users as well because they are using it instead of building rooms. Uh, in other words, uh, you can capture with the realizer a $500,000 system or maybe a million dollar dubbing stage or whatever. Uh, and that's just one of the many things you can call up at any time. And the accuracy is sufficient for you know, professional use in mixing music or uh, motion picture soundtracks and so on. So uh, it's, uh, you know, in the in professional area, you've got studios that are booked up. You've got dubbing stages that are booked up. A lot of people want to get on there at the same time and can't. So we take the engineers down to the dubbing stage, measure them there, and then they can go back to a remote workstation and mix their movie soundtrack as though they were on the dubbing stage. So it's, it's a huge... Uh, cost savings in the professional world. And I dare say in the home world, uh, it allows you to collect unaffordable um, systems and bring them home. And, uh, you know, it'll never be a substitute for speakers in the sense that you'll always want at least one speaker system in your house for communal enjoyment. But, but you can certainly collect and enjoy things that are uh, very, very expensive. And so the price of admission to that is not so great at, at 2910, I think. Right. That's actually a very good point. And in fact, Da Vinci Wonder in the chat room is asking this exact question. Can I buy a profile for an extremely nice, expensive listening environment, even if it's not my personal profile? Now, that actually has two questions as well. Uh, what, what if you can't actually gain access to a great space? So you can't do your own ears. 
can you get close enough and can you buy, say, the profile of the Sony dubbing stage or something along those lines, even if you hadn't been there? Well, we don't sell those things uh, for two reasons. One, because it's the, the realizer is uh, really so focused on personalized measurements that we kind of don't want to cloud uh, the issue there by, you know, providing non-virtualized uh, measurements. I mean, non-personalized measurements, I should say. Uh, and, and also, uh, some of these measurements are done after paying for studio time. So there's an issue there where the, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly, you, you couldn't really give out studio measurements where, where hundreds of dollars were paid for the measurement and so on. Mm, but there is, enough. but, so you won't get it from us, but there is uh, on the uh, HeadFi website, uh, there is a thread there, which is devoted to uh, people exchanging uh, their realizer measurements. And um Certainly, you may end up preferring somebody else's measurement of a superb setup. You may prefer that to your personalized measurement of a lesser setup. Now, those are two different animals. Your your lesser setup that's personalized to you is exactly what that lesser setup sounds like. The somebody else's measurement of a better setup is not exactly what that better setup sounds like. But on the other hand, you've never heard it, so you have no point of <laughs> reference. And, and uh, you may very well uh, think it's just great and enjoy it, and uh, by all means, more power to you. So you, you could look into those uh, sort of trading forums, um, if you like. <laughs> it's, this reminds me something of, um, there was a Star Trek episode, I think it was Voyager, in which uh, people on a planet were surreptitiously trading recordings of violent emotions which they had banned, sort of like the Vulcans, but this was in the Delta Quadrant. Uh, I know I'm getting, I'm geeking out here, but hey, we're all geeks on this bus. Uh, and they were they were trading and uh, these recordings of of violent emotions, and <laughs> not to not to equate the realizer with violent emotions, um, the but uh, just the the fact of trading somebody else's experience, which in this case would be the experience of an audio system. Uh, kind of reminds me of that, and it's kind of compelling. Yes, and depending on how similar your ears happen to be, uh, it may be fairly uh, pretty close to the real thing. You just don't know. But but again, uh, in in the professional situation where it has to be exact for little adjustments in EQ and so on, that's one thing. But if you're just looking for enjoyment, again, somebody else's measurement of a great setup uh, may be extremely enjoyable. There's something else the box can do, which I'd like to mention if, if I have Please. a moment here. Oh, yeah. Um, it, you can create, let's say you just have a stereo system. You can create a 5.1 or 7.1 system from those two speakers in a, in a fairly simple way. You simply turn around and measure the speakers again with them behind you for 5.1 or for 7.1, you make a third measurement where you're between those speakers. So what's interesting about this uh, is that there, imagine some very, very high-end, crazy, expensive audiophile system, whatever the craziest thing you can think of, very expensive stereo system. There probably has never been five of those or seven of those in the same room at the same time in the real world. They're just never done. And yet you can very quickly and easily uh, turn that into a five or seven channel virtual system, which is pretty crazy. Or you may be measuring... You may be measuring a 5.1 system where the 5.1 speakers are really there, okay? But mm -hmm. very typically, the center channel is not as good as the left and right, and the surround speakers may be rather poor. Well, you can capture that precisely, or you can take the good left and the good right and create five of those or seven of those. And, and they're just as accurate as if they were there because you are turning around and getting the exact angular relationship between your head and the speaker, which is the only thing that really matters. So um, that's, that's – Well, there's, there's also the room, isn't there? I mean you would, you would have a slightly different um, reflection characteristics by turning yourself around and listening to your front speakers as if they were in the rear. It would be slight, maybe, maybe not consequential. Well, you're right. Unless the room and the speaker placement were perfectly symmetrical, there would be a difference. You're quite right. Uh, is that significant? I think in most cases it's not. But if that's a concern, you can get around it completely simply by not moving your chair and moving the speakers. Move those two speakers <laughs> from left and right 
move them to your sides and to your rear at these right angles and get your 7.1 and then there's no issue at all but most people are much happier just to just to turn around and uh (laughs) you know again uh you 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 got basically the same decay time and so on it it doesn't seem to be much of an issue but for the perfectionist if you wanted to move the speakers instead certainly you can do that and and then that closes off any uh concern Sure. Uh, this is fascinating. I had not known this before about the realizer that you could take a stereo system with, uh, you know, Wilson Grand Slams or some other six figure or seven figure speakers and make a 5.1 or 7.1 out of it just by using the two speakers. That's brilliant. Yes. Actually, you're making 5.0 or 7.0, and then you right. can, at your option, for the, you, do, you do need the 0.1, so you can either measure a real subwoofer and add that to the suite of measurements. Or you can inject the LFE and any bass managed bass directly into the headphones. And that's possible because remember the whole idea of the HRTFs and so on, the measurement is for localization. Well, the LFE channel is not supposed to be localizable. So it's perfectly uh, perfectly okay to send that straight into the headphones. And in fact, uh, most subwoofers are not very good and most rooms have mode problems in the range of the subwoofer. So yep. you, you, you effectively have an ideal subwoofer with, and a room with no modes whatsoever if you inject straight into the headphones. Now, if you've got a great subwoofer, by all means, measure it. Ah, so you could measure it or you could simply inje- uh, connect the LFE channel directly into the uh, inject realizer. inject straight into the headphones. It just, right, it goes, in other words, it doesn't go through any uh, processing. It just goes straight through the realizer into the headphones. Mm-hmm. If if you if and, you want to do it that way, if you don't the have box a has the to capability to to do that, yeah, just throw a switch basically. Yeah, cool. Um, getting back to the idea of um, a more generic measurement and uh, of some great room, I do know that Mark Waldrop over at AIX Records uh, isn't he working with with you uh, to offer some sort of generic profiles of his particular room, which is quite lovely. Yes, uh, his is one of the studios I mentioned that we take people to if they want to come to town and get measured because he, his company is a rarity. It's a audiophile multi-channel record label, which an audiophile yes. and multi-channel often don't go together, but sometimes right. they do. And and he's he's got that. But yes, he has in his studio a realizer, and he's using that to uh, process uh, multi-channel his own multi-channel recordings, which you can then purchase uh, on his website. And they'll come down to you uh, through realizer processing, which is not personalized to you. So it's not the same as having your own realizer, but it is, uh, as we've said, it can be pretty effective with somebody else's head. So um, that's what he's doing there. Right. He, in fact, calls it something like XI extended something. I don't remember exactly. He he told us about it on the show uh, a couple months ago. And uh, so, so in other words, I guess I'm guessing from that that you can take the if you if you record a two channel mix that's going through the realizer using one of these generic non personalized uh, profiles from his studio or some other studio that that will then get rendered on a two channel playback system without having to have the realizer right. That's right. Uh, now, I, I don't think he's, I think, well, I mean, his, his whole thing is multi-channel. So I think what he's sending through the realizer is multi-channel. Yes. But, but yes. that brings up a good point, which is that, uh, you know, when the realizer was first designed, we thought it would be primarily, used, well, we thought it would be really a surround sound device. But we've been pleasantly surprised that a lot of people are using it for stereo. Even though you can listen to stereo in headphones and you hear the left and the right, but a lot of people really don't want the sound in their head the way it usually is with stereo headphones. They want the sound out in front, and they would like to be able to collect and emulate uh, various fancy stereo loudspeaker systems. So there's a contingent of audiophiles using the realizer for stereo. Uh, one one in the other question here in the chat room from Beatmaster. It sounds like the same premise as with guitar amp modeling, or I would also add microphone preamp modeling. Uh, it's it is somewhat similar, isn't it? Well, conceptually, it's a very it's a simple process of convolution. In other words, we 
we, we, we measure impulse responses that incorporate the speakers and the room and your head. And uh, we convolve the incoming signal with that. So the box is not doing any sort of it, it's not doing any sort of analysis and modeling that's based on analysis. There is a little bit of analysis for some some of the details, but not very much. It's mostly just a straight convolution process. So it's not. I, I guess modeling is not the right way to think of it. It's it's really a convolution. It's it's a it's giving you back the. Uh, transfer functions that we measure. So in principle, it's fairly simple. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean that it can be done without some clever choices because uh, there uh, there are clever choices in this product, but conceptually it's simple. Yeah. Berkeley Steve in the chat room is saying, this is great for the sound guy. He can do some of his work at home for a change. Well, that's right. Uh, a typical, he can do it at home or typically, let's say you're a music mixer who has his favorite studio and his monitors that he loves. He's got to go out on a remote truck so he can take the sound of his studio out on the truck. Um, so yes, he can do that. He can, he can bring the work home, uh, mix blessing, I suppose. Um, but yes, that's, that's one of the prime applications in the professional world. Or as I was saying earlier about the dubbing stages, it allows you to multiply facilities and let a bunch of people use the same very expensive facility in the virtual world at the same time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Lawn Dog is asking, uh, do you find that calibration changes when you're listening to uh, classical music versus electric guitars? Well, uh, for example... Well, the calibration, uh, the measurement would, would not be any different. In other words, if you use the same real speakers to listen to classical music and electric guitars, then you'll be listening to the same speakers in the virtual world for both classical music. And you may like those speakers for one and not the other, or you may like them right. for both. The best right. way to think about the realizer is like a little miniature box that some, somehow magically has the speakers in it. And... Um, it, it behaves the same way the real speakers do. Mm -hmm. uh, Web8772 is asking, in actual room measurements, have you ever discovered people that have their speakers wired out of phase? We discover all sorts of embarrassing things. Um, <laughs> that's, that's one of them. Uh, you also, because we're running sweeps, uh, you hear all sorts of rattles that may have been masked. You know, um, air conditioning grates or or whatever windows that that rattle. Uh, we uncover um, various distortions, like subharmonics, for example, that had been masked. So yeah, it can be it can be revealing and or embarrassing for the <laughs> for the owner. But, but hopefully, hopefully it's hopefully it's constructive because now he sees some things that he can fix. You know, right. or you, you might also say, well, those. Those sounds were masked in the real world, so they'll be masked in the virtual world as well. Right, right. Uh, well, this has been great. Anything else you want to uh, add about the realizer before we got a couple minutes left? Um, I think we've we've hit the functional things. Um, please have a look at our website. Uh, there's some write-ups and reviews on there. We've been written up by Stereophile, Absolute Sound, um, and other home-oriented publications and then the cinema audio society uh did a write-up for the professional world and so on so have a look at those because it's it's hard to convey kind of what this thing sounds like and it's silly to have me tell you it sounds good but uh let's read what those guys say about it and that might give you a bit of a feel and um also on our website is a dealer list uh, we don't have very many dealers in this country. We have a few more in, in Europe than we do over here. But uh, if you're near one of them, uh, check it out. If you're in, in the Los Angeles area, uh, shoot me an email and you'd be welcome to visit us at our lab and, and uh, email me with any questions you may have. Now, um, Steve Smith actually lives in England, right? Uh, Northern Ireland. Northern Stephen. Ireland, okay. Stephen, it is. That's right. But he comes. Stephen, he yeah. comes, comes. He comes back and forth. But he's based there. Yes. But that may be why there are more dealers in Europe than there are in the U.S. Yeah, probably so. We have distributors in Germany and France and some other European countries and uh, in Asia as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. Okay. Yeah, we we hope well, to add more dealers here. 
Uh, F Loop is asking: uh, Is Smith working on anything new? What's in the oven? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we are working on some things which we're not ready to talk about yet. But I no. think the basic, no. the, well, the, the basic technology here is not going to change. I don't think in any material way. But but we have some other, or he has some other good ideas that uh, might take us forward. Great. Will you be at CES? Uh, not as an exhibitor, no. Hmm. Well, uh, if Stephen and or you are at CES, let me know. I'd love to uh, at least uh, get together and say hi. Okay, great. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here. Laura, Kr Laura Kramer, the uh, VP at Smith Research. Uh, he's here in L.A. representing the company. And uh, if you want any more information, you can certainly go to smith-research. That's S-M-Y-T-H dash research dot com and uh, you can contact Laura from there read more about the Smith Realizer and uh, hopefully get a chance find a dealer near you and, and give it a listen because I have and it really is remarkable uh, so I do recommend that you at least give it a shot experience it for yourself and see what it's like because it's like nothing else Laura thanks so much for being here well thank you it's a pleasure uh, you can reach me, of course, by email at scott at twit.tv. Uh, you can send me suggestions for guests on the show, uh, questions, which I uh, answer on The Tech Guy, and also at Secrets of Home Theater and High Fidelity at hometheaterhifi.com. And, uh, in fact, I want to make sure everyone knows that uh, this coming weekend, November 17th and 18th, I will be filling in for Leo uh, on the Tech Guy Radio Show, Saturday and Sunday, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Pacific time. You can go to techguylabs.com to look for a station that might carry the show in your area. Of course, some stations don't carry the entire show. Others carry it on tape delay. So the best thing to do is to log on to live.twit.tv and watch the show with video as we record. Got a couple of great guests coming on the show on Saturday as well. Gary Rizzo, a, uh, an Academy Award winning re-recording mixer who worked on Wreck-It Ralph, uh, the very recent uh, animated uh, movie that's just come out. And also Peter Ramsey, the director of the new DreamWorks animation movie uh, called Rise of the Guardians, which doesn't get released until November 21st. But I actually saw a pre-screening, and it's remarkable. It's a beautiful, beautifully animated movie. So I'm going to be talking to those guys and answering your calls. So please do tune in. Uh, next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Robert Heron, who is a well-known home theater journalist. And he's going to be joining me in the Twit Brickhouse studio uh, since I'll be up there anyway, I, might, I figured I might as well do the show from there. So I'm going to be doing it live from the studio on Monday the 19th with Robert Heron in studio. And we will be talking about a variety of things, including my calibration of Leo Laporte's televisions. So uh, we, should, uh, we should see some interesting results there. I assume his... I believe his Panasonic, his new Panasonic TV will calibrate very well. His older Pioneer... Who knows? Might be great, might not. Tune in to see. That's next Monday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. So until then, geek out.